the revolution will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised. The revolution will be no rerun, brothers. The revolution will be live. In almost any class I do, I find some way to make the point that politics is more than elections. That is to say, if, if I were 19 years old and I thought politics meant what happens between Republicans and Democrats and what I watch on MSNBC and Fox News, I wouldn't want anything to do with, I don't think any sane human being would want anything to do with politics. Anybody with any self-respect would run from politics if politics was nothing but elections in the contemporary context. So I always spend a lot of time with students just making the point that politics is a struggle for power. In any society, wherever two or more are gathered, there is power. There is power operating formally, informally, and politics is nothing but the struggle to decide how to structure that power. And in that sense, if students tell me, well, I'm not into politics, I'm apolitical, I just respond and tell them, well, that just means you're a chump. You're not very smart. Because there is no, there's no such thing as being apolitical. You are either engaged in an activity to try and affect the distribution of power, or someone else is doing it for you. As I was packing up the books uh, and thinking about what I might say today, I realized what's most interesting is not the books that are here, but the books that aren't here. Uh, because I made a decision to keep um, my complete collection of a, of a number of authors. And as I was looking at what I knew I wouldn't part with, uh, it gave me kind of an interesting little summary of my own intellectual and political life. And there are really four authors that you won't find here. <laughs> um, and I thought they might be interesting to, to talk about. One is the feminist writer Andrea Dworkin. I kept my entire collection of Andrea. Uh, one is James Baldwin, the novelist, essayist, political activist from the last half of the 20th century who wrote so eloquently about race, among other things. Uh, one is Noam Chomsky. Uh, I did give up a few duplicate Noam Chomsky books, but kept most of my Noam collection. And the fourth person I would not part with was Wendell Berry. And as I was looking at, at those four, I realized that sort of defines my intellectual and political life. I got radicalized through feminism about 24 years ago when I went back to graduate school in 1988. Uh, prior to that, had no real experience with politics of any kind, was a typical run-of-the-mill uh, American, in other words, clueless, uh, maybe still clueless, but at least clueless in a different way now. Uh, and so the, the first real issue I bumped up against in graduate school was feminism, uh, which I had no experience with. And it was a particularly sort of fruitful time in feminism. The late 1980s, uh, there had been a tremendous amount of feminist intellectual work and political activism, and I landed right square in that. Uh, and started doing work, as the collection outside would indicate, on the issue of pornography and men's violence and sexual exploitation of women more generally. At the time, one of the hot issues was the feminist critique of pornography, and the central figure in that had been a woman named Andrea Dworkin, who had begun writing, coming out of the more general radical movement of the 60s, writing about men's violence, especially in the 1970s, and then at the end of the 70s and in the early 80s, pioneering a real um, radical look at not only pornography, but what I would call the sexual exploitation industries more generally. Prostitution, pornography, stripping, the way that men routinely buy and sell women's bodies in this culture. And for a, a kid coming out of Fargo, North Dakota, uh, it was quite a, a revelation, kind of turned my world upside down and made me realize everything I'd been told about feminiz feminism by the dominant culture, you know what feminism tells men about the dominant, feminism from the dominant culture is defined as uh, the whining of ugly women who can't get dates. That's what I knew about feminism. Right? That's what the culture had told me. Uh, don't take any of this seriously. And then I actually started reading feminist work and meeting women involved in feminist politics and all of a sudden I realized the culture had been lying to me all those years. That, 
feminists weren't ugly women who couldn't get dates. They were very exciting, bright, engaged women who were critiquing patriarchy, male violence, male power. And that was a really important experience because it, it, it kind of flipped a switch in me and made me realize that everything I thought might need to be rethought. And uh, the first door that opened up for me was gender. But after that, when you see how hierarchy works, how hierarchy is naturalized, how dominance works, it's kind of hard not to see it in other realms. And that's what happened to me in those very fruitful four years of graduate school and after. I just started sort of systematically trying to make my way through how power operates in the United States. And so once the gender door was opened, it was kind of hard not to go through the race door. And James Baldwin was really crucial in that process for me. If you haven't read Baldwin, I highly recommend it. Uh, he made his mark as a novelist, uh, but quickly became central in the civil rights movement, not as a representative of, of a specific group or even a specific point of view. Uh, he certainly um, was never associated with any particular political endeavor, but he was a really important voice. Um, he's, in my mind, uh, you know, a contemporary and just as important as Martin Luther King Jr. Malcolm X, that generation of African-American leaders. Uh, and Baldwin, uh, for me, was important because early on in the 1960s, he was writing these very, very penetrating essays on not just what it meant to be black in the United States, but what it meant to be white. And later, when I went back to graduate school and discussions about white privilege and whiteness were coming into vogue, uh, often writing by white people, it was always really helpful for me to have Baldwin as a touchstone to go back. Uh, I just finished writing a book chapter for an edited collection, and I went back and reread or read some of the previously unpublished Baldwin, and I was again just struck by the, the clarity of the insights, especially thinking about those insights being published in the early 1960s. Uh, and it was a reminder that one of the marks of a great writer is not just the effect on them, uh, the effect their work has when you read it, but when you reread it. Anything, anytime I find myself going back and rereading an author, I know I'm onto something. And when I reread and gain new insight, um, that's a keeper. So you won't find any James Baldwin here, you won't find any Andrew Dworkin here. And those two really did help structure the way I thought um, as a, a young person trying to come to terms with the way power operates in the world. Uh, after that, eventually, uh, I bumped in pretty quickly to Noam Chomsky. I always say I wish I had a dollar for every lefty I met who, when you ask them, how did you get politicized, they say, well, I read this book by this guy named Chomsky, and uh, life changes. Uh, and because Chomsky is so prolific and has written about such a wide variety of subjects, a lot of us have had that experience of being radicalized by Chomsky. For me, it was around media. I was in graduate school studying mass media and journalism, and it was shortly after he and Ed Herman had published The Manufacture of Consent, which was a crucial uh, analysis of the way mainstream media is so often co-opted by power. Uh, once I started reading that, there was, of course, all of his work on foreign policy, all of his work on economics. Uh, I dipped my toe into his work on linguistics and realized very quickly I wasn't smart enough to understand that, so moved on. Uh, and, and I suspect for a lot of people here, um, some similar experience with Chomsky is uh, very familiar. Uh, and then finally, and uh, uh, last book in time, but not in importance, is uh, the work of Wendell Berry. Uh, I had been through a lot of this work on race and gender and economics and foreign policy and started to understand that there were other, in, in some sense, a, a, a bigger issue, which was the question of ecological sustainability, that um, all these other issues around social justice, how are wealth and power distributed, are crucial if one wants to create a just society in which we can claim to be fully human. But none of it much matters if we're going to take the planet down in the next two or three generations, which is apparently the trajectory we're on. So uh, as I was developing uh, this critique of power in 
the traditional senses around race and gender, uh, around economics and imperialism. I also started spending a whole lot more time thinking about ecological sustainability. And for me, the entry point was sustainable agriculture, the quest to figure out how we can transcend the current system of producing food, which typically gets called industrial agriculture, which is heavily mechanized, dependent on oil, and environmentally uh, a catastrophe. How do we transcend that and start figuring out a way to grow food that is uh, truly sustainable? Uh, and Wendell Berry is one of the key figures in that. If you're not familiar with his work, he's a poet, he's a novelist, he writes short stories, but he's often best known for his essays on uh, what sustainability might look like. His book, The Unsettling of America, was an early important text on that, uh, going back to the, I think, early 80s. Uh, and then uh, just a, an amazing uh, sort of library of work that he's produced. Uh, and I didn't give up any of my Wendell Berry. That's all still sitting on my shelf. Uh, so those are. The, the sort of reflections that came to me from going through my own library and asking what's important, who's important, what are the ideas that I want to make sure I keep connected to. Um, you'll see books out there on all of these subjects, uh, and they continue to be issues I'm really concerned about. Uh, so I hope people pick up as many of those books as possible. You know, when I first started reading Chomsky, he was still a somewhat marginal figure in the mainstream. Uh, his books were still being published often by smaller presses. South End Press, for instance, uh, got its start publishing people like Chomsky. A couple of decades since, and Chomsky has become much more prominent. Um, one can even see him on mainstream media now and then. Uh, for me, what Chomsky helped me do was sort out the different left traditions. So um, there's the traditional sort of Marxist-Leninist strain of thinking on the left. There's the anarchist schools of thought. Uh, and I was not trained in those as a young person. So when I got into politics in my early 30s, uh, I was both blessed without the baggage of having ever been recruited into some crazy left sectarian <laughs> group as a college student, but also I didn't have the background. And, and be, although I wouldn't say that Chomsky is an easy read, he's a very dense writer, he's, from my mind, a very clear writer. And the way he explained the differences between, for instance, anarchist and Leninist traditions was really useful to me. So part of it was an intellectual question of how do I start to sort out uh, a century and a half of left thinking and understand where I fit in that. And the other important aspect of Chomsky uh, was the kind of relentless critique of U.S. foreign policy uh, and, and a really kind of stunning body of work uh, that explains that. But I think what's important about Chomsky for me as much as the actual content of the books and the ideas is, uh, and he would probably hate, I'm sure he hates it when people say this, but uh, Noam Chomsky is a kind of role model. Uh, Chomsky is, whatever one thinks of his politics, you know, a brilliant uh, a brilliant thinker who could have easily spent his whole life uh, working in linguistics and philosophy of mind, philosophy of science, and had a lovely career and been very popular in uh, the mainstream. But his conscience took him in a different direction. And so for a lot of us who are academics by uh, profession, um, it's hard to find very many role models in academic life who stay true to a commitment to liberatory politics, and Chomsky did that. The other thing about Chomsky, he's been through Austin a couple of times. I've had a chance to meet him. And for anyone who's ever met him, the, the other thing that's so striking is what a normal person he is. Uh, he's probably the single smartest human being I've ever met personally, and he's also exceedingly normal. Um, he doesn't like the cult of celebrity around him. He does his best to try to uh, minimize it. Uh, but for all of the accomplishments and all of the fame, when you actually sit down with him, uh, he's just a regular guy uh, who drinks regular run-of-the-mill, not very expensive beer. Uh, it's just <laughs> was kind of uh, it gives one a bit of hope um, that the human species is redeemable. So that's those are my sort of 
main thoughts about Chomsky, I think. The question is, what about Ward Churchill? I, I read a lot of Ward, and, and Ward's work was really important to me as well. If you're not familiar, Ward Churchill is a, a was, until he got fired, a scholar at the University of Colorado at Boulder who wrote a really compelling work on the question of indigenous America. And for me, the importance of Ward Churchill was getting my head around the concept of genocide. Uh, the, the reality that the European invasion of the Americas was not just um, something that res resulted in the unfortunate death of people, uh, it was genocide. And the argument for why that is the appropriate term to describe the European invasion of the Americas uh, is really important. And Ward makes that argument, I think, in a compelling as fashion as anyone I've read, uh, and does it with a lot of clarity and, and real passion as well. Um, I was able to meet him a couple of times. We had him here in Austin to speak. He gave a great talk. Um, this was all before he got embroiled in the controversies after 9-11. Uh, and lots of people have critiqued Ward on lots of different levels. But for me, what I remember is as a, you know, sort of run-of-the-mill middle American white guy who grew up in a part of the country, North Dakota, where the only significant non-white population was indigenous, um, and having grown up with absolutely no understanding of that history or what that meant, Ward was really, really important for me to start to get a handle not only on that in kind of an intellectual sense, but in a personal sense, since I had grown up in a, in a way in Indian country. Um, and I also owe Ward a favor because one of my first books called Citizens of the Empire, uh, which I wrote after the invasion of Iraq, which I thought was quite a good book, actually. Uh, I found that very few people agreed, or at least the people in publishing I was sending it to didn't seem to agree. And so after uh, that manuscript had been rejected by a lot of people, I, I dropped Ward a note because his publisher was City Lights in San Francisco. And I said, Ward, would you mind writing a note to your editor suggesting that she take a look at my manuscript? And he did that as a favor. It's very kind of him. And the editor took the book, and it was the first of two, and now three books I'm going to do with City Lights. So I kind of owe Ward Churchill for being a nice guy, which is kind of funny because most people don't think of Ward as a very nice guy. He's, he's tall, imposing, and loud. Uh, but to me, Ward is also this very sweet guy who did me a favor as well. So. The specific question about whether or not Chomsky minimized the the horror of the genocide under the Khmer Rouge uh, has been brought up over and over again. I, I don't recall specifically, it's a long time since I read it, but his position is that he was not minimizing that. He was using that to compare the way that the Western political and intellectual class treated that particular genocide as opposed to other genocides, particularly the Indonesian, uh, the mass killings in Indonesia. And the point was that when it's an official enemy, we play up the, the murder, the, the mass murder. When it's an official ally, we play it down. And I think that would be the point he would make, that he was not apologizing for the Khmer Rouge. He was using it as a, a, a point of comparison. Uh, the bigger question of do I have uh, disagreements with anyone, um, sure. Uh, I can't imagine you would read the complex work of folks like this and not find points of disagreement. And more importantly, I would think that those four writers and the other writers I admire would encourage that kind of disagreement. Uh, uh, really bright people are interesting because when you're really bright, I don't have this problem. It's, I think, uh, one, I always say one of my great strengths is that I'm mediocre and I know it. But really smart people tend to believe they're right and assume that others should accept it. But in, in this case, I think, all four of those writers were very passionate, and when you, especially when you heard them speak, um, they gave as good as they got. They responded to critiques very powerfully. Uh, but I also think there's a kind of openness in all of them. Uh, just to take an example, Wendell Berry is on my mind because he was just in Austin um, last December with Wes Jackson and did a conversation on stage. Um, and there's a lot of Wendell Berry's work that uh, it's not so much that I disagree with it, that I think that, like all of us, he has places where he misses. So I often read his books and, and wonder 
how much he thinks about or might be open to a feminist critique around gender. Um, and that's not so much something I would attack him about, but be kind of curious to talk about. Uh, when I look at some of the ways Andrea argued the position, I would probably argue it differently. Uh, often very subtle but important distinctions around language and claims one makes. I tend to be, I, I always say I'm very much where I come from. I'm a sort of um, ordinary guy from Fargo, North Dakota, cautious by nature, you know. So I tend to make arguments in ways that I think are, are conservative in the sense of trying not to overdrive what I think I might know. Uh, so yeah, there's all sorts of places uh, where I might disagree uh, and, and could identify them. I'm not so sure about Baldwin. I've never heard J James Baldwin say, nor have I ever read anything by Baldwin that I found I disagreed with. Um, maybe it just means I need to read more. Uh, one other note about Baldwin, by the way, is uh, one of the things Baldwin was really known for was not just his writing, but his speaking. Uh, and there's a fair amount on YouTube, interviews with him, um, old recordings of speeches he gave. Uh, and when I went back to reread him for this most recent project, I also made a point of trying to find as much material online as I could. And I was just overwhelmed, especially in his interviews and speeches, with, for lack of a better word, his humanity. It just, it came out of every pore of that man. That this was a, a, a man who was fully alive in the world. And that meant he was capable of incredible humor and joy. You could just see, he was well known as being the life of, of every party. Uh, and it's obvious why he got that reputation when you watch him. But also a kind of, um, I don't, a, a kind of very deep grief that he carried around and was unafraid to let out. And that's a tricky thing to do in public. Uh, and when I think of all the speakers I've heard, I can't think of anyone who articulated grief, not personal self-indulgent sadness, but a, a, a deeper philosophical and political grief over the state of the world. Uh, and it's just incredibly compelling. Uh, there's a wonderful documentary about Baldwin called The Price of the Ticket that I, for a while, was showing to one of my classes. Uh, and it uniformly had the effect of reducing most of the class to tears. Not because he was maudlin or sad, but because that you just couldn't, in the face of all of that humanity, not react yourself. That's an interesting question. So I'm 53 years old. I was born in 1958. Uh, so I'm too young to have had direct experience with the Panthers or the Weather Underground. You know, in that, that sort of distinctive year, 1968, when so much happened, uh, I was 10 years old, and I was painfully coming to the realization that I was not going to be a professional baseball player uh, in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, so I'm too young to have gone through those experiences associated with the 60s. Uh, so when I read about the Panthers or the Weather Underground, it's purely historical for me. Uh, but those movements, of course, have a huge effect on anyone who's political on the left today, uh, both in the, I think, the way they remind us of what movements can accomplish, and the perhaps even more important reminder of how quickly movements can go off the rails. Uh, the Panthers and the Weather Underground is an offshoot of SDS is very good examples of that. Uh, but also, although it's sometimes fashionable to beat up on groups like that, uh, in hindsight to explain how crazy they were and what did those nutty anti-war kids think they were doing making bombs in a, in a brownstone in New York City or you know, the Panthers degrading into a kind of cult of the gun. But it's also important to remember that two things. One is that those groups were always under assault from uh, the federal government. The later revelations about the COINTELPRO program of the FBI, uh, although a lot of it was known before that, um, remind us that when you really challenge power in the United States, uh, that the system does have the capacity to come down hard. Uh, and it's a reminder that in the 1960s, people in power in the United States were really threatened. Uh, you know, we, 
we sit here today and it's hard to imagine the, well, maybe it's not so hard to imagine, uh, people in power really worrying that these movements were going to crumble the whole system. And when power is threatened it, at that sort of level, it tends to react quite violently, and the United States did. Um, and the other thing is, uh, especially thinking about the weather underground, this sense of despair. Um, by the early 70s, the, the, a lot of the hopes of those movements were clearly not going to be realized. For instance, the anti-war movement had been going for, for a number of years at a fairly high level uh, with massive public participation, and the U.S. was still grinding away in Southeast Asia as if nothing had changed. And that sense that you're surrounded um, by evil <laughs> and that evil is not going to respond to regular means of political intervention uh, can and probably should make you crazy. It's probably a healthy reaction to be driven mad by the depravity of power. Uh, the corrective is, of course, to remember that giving in to that um, really isn't very effective as well. And I think a, a lot of us might feel that around the ecological crisis at this point. We are literally uh, engaged in activities that, if not within my lifetime, certainly within the lifetime of my child, may make it impossible for the ecosphere to sustain human life at the level we've come to understand it. That's a pretty big deal, and it's easy to get really angry and really crazy about that, especially when you're not only not making progress, you're losing ground. The percentage of the American population that believes global warming is real and it's because of human causes has gone down over the last decade. When you're facing a world in which the accumulation of evidence has no effect on public perceptions. When you're facing a system where concentrated wealth and power can deploy that wealth to make sure that that state of ignorance continues, it's easy to imagine going a little crazy. Uh, and so when I think about all those old 60s movements, I try and um, look at them critically, but also look at them with a kind of compassion as a reminder that we're facing the same things today. Well, first of all, the, the fact there may be fewer people going to college might well be a good thing. Uh, I say that as someone with 20 years of experience at um, the ideological factory commonly known as the University of Texas at Austin, which for all of the promise of the modern liberal university, I mean liberal in the sort of enlightenment sense, not in a political sense, uh, the space for real critical thinking in the universities has contracted in my career. Uh, when I went, when I started teaching at 1992, in 1992 here, there was more room for real critical thinking than there is today. The, what we often call the corporatization of the university, both in its internal organization and in its reliance on external funding from corporate sources, really has shrunk the space. Uh, when I started graduate school in 1988 with the intention of becoming a professor, um, first of all, I didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> and second, there was more room for what eventually I realized I wanted to do. Uh, a lot of that room doesn't exist anymore. And I'm really worried um, that universities are not going to be even a, a safe haven for critical thinking. The truth is I don't think universities ever were really meant to foster a serious critique of power. But they did provide that sort of safe haven, and there's less and less of that these days. So that makes me really nervous. Uh, at the, the level of the public school system, high school, middle school, the obsession with standardized testing and all of that has really gutted what little space there was there. There are some extraordinary high school teachers, a couple are friends of mine, who managed to teach um, well, teach exceptionally, but it's in spite of the system. And you can't, you can't rest your hopes on uh, exceptional people transcending a system. Um, and people with children in high school probably know this more uh, than I do. But that, uh, the notion that we can turn education, which always was treated as a kind of factory, uh, literally into a process that can be quantified in the same way that production of widgets can be, uh, sort of signals the final death, I think, of education. So I'm not very upbeat on any of this. 
Uh, beyond that, uh, it's interesting also, I'm going to divert a little bit, digress a bit. Uh, in my university life, I've also seen what does and doesn't make it into the canon. What's considered, you know, literature worth teaching. And the example that's on my mind now is James Baldwin. So here's James Baldwin, who in the second half of the 20th century in the United States, I would argue, was not only one of the, the premier black writers, but just one of the premier writers. I mean, just an amazing presence who, who wrote in all genres. He wrote plays, he wrote essays, he wrote novels. He had a public life, uh, very prominent. Uh, when I ask my students today, how many have heard of Martin Luther King Jr., they all raise their hands. When I ask them, how many have heard of Malcolm X, they all raise their hands. They might have somewhat distorted ideas about who these guys were, but they heard them. I say, how many of you know James Baldwin? And nary a hand goes up. Unless a student was in, usually unless a student was in an African-American literature class where they read a Baldwin novel, they don't know who he was. Mm -hmm. uh, and so why is that? Why is one of the most compelling intellectual figures of the last half of the 20th century essentially been disappeared from the canon? Uh, my own theory is it's because he was too insightful, especially about the nature of whiteness. He wrote too clearly and concisely. He was too accessible. Uh, and that's just not good, because then young people start to get ideas. Um, Andrew Dworkin is another person who's been essentially written out of the canon, in, in this case, even in women's studies. She's virtually untaught these days. Uh, and younger students going through uh, women's studies often have never heard of her. So uh, it's not only that the space for education is shrinking in a sense, but what we count as, you know, the important work has changed as well. And that's a function not just of some problem in education, it's a function of the culture. Right? Education is not a, doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, just like if you want to critique the news media, you have to take it in the context of the culture because none of these institutions operate independently. Um, and when you add all of that up, uh, what's clear is, to me is that the institutions are not going to foster critical space for critical thinking. They may allow it in minor ways, but they're not going to foster it, which means that in addition to organizing people to pressure legislators to get out in the streets for whatever it is that we want to achieve politically, Part of left, progressive, radical, call it what you want, organizing is also about then creating the spaces for that intellectual work that isn't going to get done in the dominant culture's institutions. And by intellectual work, I don't want to sound snotty or elitist. I don't mean intellectual in the sense that, you know, some people would use that term as a sign of um, a removal from the ordinary. I'm talking about the intellectual work that we all need to do to just understand how systems and structures of power work. And that's got to be part of our organizing as well, because people aren't getting it elsewhere. Campus activism is probably, in my 20 years at UT, at its lowest point. Uh, it was quite noticeable that when the U.S. invasion of Iraq took place, instead of a youth-led anti-war movement in which older folks like myself might join in, which was, of course, the, the nature of the anti-Vietnam movement. What we had instead was a movement uh, mostly organized by older people like me in which some young people were participating. Uh, there have been some really great examples of organizing on campus. Um, there's this anti-sweatshop group working right now with a lot of commitment. Um, but in general, campus activism is deader than I've ever seen it. What has grown at UT and in universities around the country is not political activism, but volunteerism. One of the ways universities figured out how to, to gut the, the radical potential of student activism was to channel everybody into volunteerism. Right? So instead of asking how do you change the nature of power so uh, inequity between um, tra uh, traditionally low-income black and brown schools, traditionally upper-income white schools, instead of figuring out politically how do you bust that, uh, students are channeled into doing after-school reading programs at, at disadvantaged schools. I got nothing against reading programs at disadvantaged schools, uh, and in some ways it's 
you know, very healthy for all of us to do work like that, but that's not politics. That's not challenging power. That's social service work. And many in the room here are familiar with the sort of non-profitization of politics on the left in the U.S., the way in which people who in other generations might have been part of radical political organizing are now in non-profit work. And that's a complex subject because some of the best work I know being done politically is being done by nonprofits. So here in town, I'm reminded of the Workers' Defense Project, which is a, organized as a traditional 501c3 nonprofit group, uh, but is doing a very politicized uh, kind of work in the community that I think is really, um, really important and which I try to, to contribute to. Uh, but there's a whole lot of nonprofits that have been gutted politically by virtue of the realities of funding. Um, some of you may know the book, The Revolution Will Not Be Funded, the critique of the so-called nonprofit industrial complex. And just like, you know, universities have been sucked in, the media have been sucked in, nonprofits get, get sucked into this system of power. And so I think that's had a big effect. Uh, I can't tell you how many students come into my office and they want nothing to do with the corporate world. They don't want to go off into the world and just make money. But they assume their only other option is to go to work for a nonprofit. Um, and the idea of political organizing doesn't really cross their minds. And we have to change that. We have to make politics attractive in a way that it really isn't for most young people right now. The real struggle is to get young people especially although this applies to old folks too. A lot of people in my own generation are similarly disgusted and have dropped out, thinking that there's no way to affect change except through electoral politics. So uh, as you point out, how do we make political engagement attractive? Uh, and I think here there's a lot to learn from the right wing. Uh, this is not an original point, but the right wing provides people not only with political activity, opportunities for political activity, they provide people with meaning. They provide people with a place to be. That a lot of right, especially uh, church-based right-wing organizing, doesn't just fulfill your need to be a good citizen. It fulfills a lot of your, your needs as a person. And if you look back on the left, historically, a lot of left activity was also very multifaceted like that. Say what you want about the Communist Party USA, at one point, the Communist Party was not only a vehicle for political organizing or labor organizing, it was, it was a way you structured your life. I've had an opportunity to talk to some of those old folks who were part of the CP back in the old days. And it, there were a lot of really negative aspects to it, but it provided you with meaning in your life in a certain way. And the dominant culture doesn't do that. You know, I always say this is a culture, uh, an economy that produces an abundance of everything except meaning. And people are struggling for that. And I think on the left, our organizations have to do a better job of creating that. And so I, you know, I mentioned the Workers' Defense Project, and it's a great example of a group that not only organizes people toward political goals, it provides a space for people to live, to come together, to associate outside of just the workplace or just the mall. And we need to create more of those, I think, more of those kinds of spaces. And that means not only focused on short-term goals, but also thinking more about the long-term, which maybe it's just because I'm getting old, but is increasingly on my mind. How do you not just try and organize to win struggles in the moment, but organize to create alternatives to the dominant culture? The more I got into academic life and political life, I found it was really easy to give up reading fiction because there was always another book to read about the subject of the day. There was always another magazine article I needed to read. There was always something that was compelling in the political or intellectual world that crowded out the time I had for fiction. And at some point, I essentially stopped reading fiction <laughs> and realized that was probably a mistake, um, that part of politics is also about that creative aspect of our lives and thinking about the world differently. Uh, I've had a couple of classes where I was able to teach novels, interdisciplinary classes, and, it, and so I would force myself to go back to read for, for 
potential books for class. And there were some books that had been really compelling uh, as I did that. As I said, Wendell Berry's fiction um, was really important because it looks back at rural life and talks about the values uh, for all of the limitations of rural life, that the communal values of rural America, which have been largely erased by the industrialization of agriculture in the countryside, uh, were really important. And I taught a novel of, of Barry's called Jaber Crow to a group of 18-year-old first semester at UT, mostly urban kids. And I was reminded of the power of good writing because most of these kids, uh, what they knew about fields might have been when they drove by one on the way to the mall in suburban Dallas. And yet, Barry is such an evocative writer that he creates this world that they could inhabit. Uh, and that was really, really important. The other writer, uh, kind of on the other end, is um, Octavia Butler, who was always called a science fiction writer, but it struck me as she was always more than a science fiction writer. And I taught a book of hers called The Parable of the Sower, which is a dystopic um, look at the American future. Uh, and also a book I taught in that same class that 18-year-olds could, could grab a hold of. And so both of those books and, and both of those writers uh, kind of nag at me and keep saying in the back of my mind saying, why don't you read some more novels now and then? You're getting boring, Jensen. You're getting old. Uh, and when we went through at home to collect books for this, uh, the fact that my wife, who's a, an artist, a songwriter, uh, a much more interesting person than I am, uh, one of the reasons she's more interesting is she reads a lot of fiction um, and is constantly stimulating her own imagination that way. So my New Year's resolution, uh, on July 7th is to read more fiction in the coming year. And I think that's probably more important than ever because um, we are at a point politically where the old, um, the old truths we, th we thought we knew about how political change was gonna come and the old systems we thought were gonna replace the existing systems are not adequate. Uh, it's really one of those moments where we have to invent. And part of the process of invention means going outside what we know and challenging ourselves. <laughs>